वेलकम एवरी वन वी आर मीटिंग फॉर द सेकेंड फाउंडेशन एनिवर्सरी ऑफ द क्लब ऑफ मैथमेटिक्स एट आई टी वी एम वी फॉर्म द क्लब टू ईयर्स बैक इन टू थाउजेंड एटीन विद ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑफ हैविंग अ स्ट्रॉगर मैथमेटिकल कम्युनिटी इन द इंस्टीट्यूट एंड सीन्स दैन वी हैव बिन डूइंग अ लॉट ऑफ नाइस थिंग्स एंड देर हैज बिन सपोर्ट फ्राम द स्टूडेंट कम्युनिटी एट आइजर एज वेल एज द फैकल्टीज ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट एंड वी आर वेरी हैप्पी रिगार्डिंग हाउ थिंग्स हैव टर्न आउट सीन्स दैन and we are planning to do a lot of things in future i hope uh, we will get continuous support like this we are very happy that we could celebrate today uh, in this form even though we are not in the campus and we are very happy about the faculty's agreeing to the talk and everyone who has joined us right now and will join us in future for the other talks in the two days so without further ado let me introduce today's speaker uh, the first speaker of the day is dr shreer shridharan from the school of mathematics at ith trivandrum dr shridharan has been a part of the school of mathematics since 2014 prior to that he held faculty positions at the chennai mathematical institute and iit guwahati dr shridharan completed his phd from the university of manchester uk his research interests and work mainly focuses on complex dynamics and ergodic theory he has contributed towards various aspects in the analysis of julia sets in maps apart from this dr shreer is an avid reader and a wonderful writer He occasionally writes on various topics of his interest, which are always knowledgeable and interesting to read. He is also quite friendly and fun to talk with the students and the people in the institute. I would like to mention specially that back in 2018, when we were supposed to start the faculty talk series for the club, uh, we were supposed to have Dr. Shriyari as the inaugural speaker, which couldn't materialize due to various reasons. So this talk has actually been due for over two years. and we have been waiting enthusiastically for this and we are very glad to have him today as a first speaker of cmit's foundation anniversary so he'll talk about arbitrary long arithmetic progressions as well as some open problem of erdos related to the topic so over to him uh, first of all thank you very much uh, to the club for inviting me to give a talk uh, you know in your forum uh, the invitation is uh, actually Uh, slightly old but uh, i could only give a talk uh, today uh, since i will enter uh, the full screen mode i will not be able to see messages that are being typed over there in between if at all there is in such a case i mean however i am not stopping you from uh, writing down any questions or something in between if if it's necessary uh, if something i mean if 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 my attention needs to be drawn to something that has been written i request one of you guys to take charge and you know interrupt me and read out the question to me so that i can uh, listen to the question and maybe answer that sure sir uh, the coordinators will moderate what is happening in the chat and will inform you if necessary absolutely that would be great so the title of my talk is arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions throughout this talk i'll only be dealing with Uh, z the set of integers let's first understand what the title means in order to understand the title there are three different things that i need to understand what is an arithmetic progression this is a question that we all know the answer uh, we've been studying arithmetic progression since high school days and therefore we know what an arithmetic progression is the second question i need to answer is what do we mean by length of an arithmetic progression and the third thing is when do we say an arithmetic progression is arbitrarily long let's try and answer uh, each of these questions before we go further an arithmetic progression is a sequence of numbers that are separated by some common difference between them for example I mean you can write down several examples for that matter i have just given you two such examples over here in the first example the common difference is 7 and in the second example the common difference is 5 what do we mean by its length the number of terms in the arithmetic progression is defined to be the length of the arithmetic progression so again the example that i have already uh, written over here tells you that i have the first uh, arithmetic progression is of length 5 the second one is of length 7 what is stopping me from writing furthermore nothing i can as well write some more numbers and say hey you know what 
my length is 27 or my length is uh, a zillion but then i've just stopped here and therefore the length is 5 and 7 respectively for these two examples that's about it when do we say an arithmetic progression is arbitrarily long now an arithmetic progression is arbitrarily long if you give me a positive integer and then i find an arithmetic progression of the length satisfying your number whatever number you have given me to find an arithmetic progression of any positive number that you give me if i can do that then i then i will say that you know hey you know what to any number that you give i am able to find out an arithmetic progression and therefore we have arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions now this is not such a big deal i mean after all we live in the set of integers and therefore inside the set of integers whatever positive number you give me uh, i can find out an arithmetic progression but then there comes the point i am not wanting to look for arithmetic progressions I'm sorry arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions in all of the set of integers i want to look at this when i take a to be a subset of this uh, of the integers then when does a contain arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions now from now on i'm not going to say arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions this term itself is sufficiently long and mouthful for me i'm going to only call it as ala uh, i'm not sure how many of you here are familiar with uh, classical music if you go to a classical music concert uh, especially carnatic music this is this is what i'm familiar with and therefore probably the same is true in hindustani as well but if you go to a you know a classical music concert then there are rags you know certain raga to which you know the singer uh, performs an ala you can tell the singer beforehand that hey you know what whatever piece you do i want to listen to an ala for 5 minutes i want to listen to an ala for 25 minutes i want to listen to an ala for you know 15 minutes you tell him whatever and believe me sufficiently trained singers can deliver it to you so you give them a positive number they can do an ala for that long a time this is precisely you know what we are doing here as well right you give me a positive number and i will give you an arithmetic progression of that length and therefore i am justified in calling arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions using this particular uh, terminology ala and we say that this subset a contains ala if for every k in z plus there exists an element little a in a and you can find a d in z plus such that you look at this k long arithmetic progression a a plus d etc until a plus k d okay it should have rather been a plus k minus 1 d but then you get the point all these numbers should belong to my set a if this is true then you say your set a contains ala the first theorem in this direction was written by van der woorden in 1927 he said consider a finite partition of the set of integers given by b1 union b2 union etc let's take until br you have a finite partition and therefore my r is finite it is a partition and therefore what i expect for that to be a partition is that my bi's are all non empty and bi intersection bj is empty the union of this already gives you the set of integers when you have a finite partition of the set of integers in this fashion van der woorden's theorem tells you that at least one of the r subsets of z contains ala now here is a picture of van der woorden from he lived from 1903 to 1996 and before we actually go about looking for a proof of van der woorden we will look at something else that theorem makes it easier for us to prove van der woorden we will uh, look at some examples to start with let's take z to be equal to b1 union b2 union etc until br where the sets b2 onwards until br they are all finite sets then it makes no sense for you to 
look for alap in these sets b2 to br and therefore your b1 will contain alap you give any uh, positive integer i should be able to find out uh, arbitrarily long arithmetic progression only in b1 let's look at the second example you can partition your set of integers as odd numbers union even numbers if you do that then both these elements in the partition contains alap you can as well consider a partition of the set of integers as prime numbers union composite numbers what do you think do we have alap in both these partitions we will look at that as we go along let's look at a theorem of schmiderity this is what uh, i probably you know jumped ahead of myself when i uh, started tell telling after van der waarden's theorem we will look at the theorem of schmiderity and then try to prove van der waarden's theorem using schmiderity's theorem schmiderity's theorem tells you if b is a subset of of the set of integers with strictly positive upper density we still have to define what upper density means we will do that in a bit but then if b is a set with strictly positive upper density then the set b contains ala is what schmiderity tells us let's fix a notation for this talk whenever i write m comma n within square brackets i actually look at the set of all integers between m and n usually this notation is supposed to mean the interval between m and n in r but then i am not going to be bothered about things in the real line for this talk i said we are only going to look at the set of integers and therefore whenever i write m comma n within square brackets i am only going to be looking at the integers between m and n now for any set b in z we define its density as so look at b intersected with minus n comma n the set of all integers between minus n comma n there are 2n plus 1 of them you have n integers on your positive side you have n integers on your negative side and you have zero in between so you have 2n plus 1 of them you divide it by 2n plus 1 so you look at b intersection minus n comma n look at the cardinality of this set and divide this by 2n plus 1 and take limit as n goes to infinity this gives you the density of the set b but then uh, i did not ask for a density i only asked for upper density uh, does this limit exist does, does this limit not exist everywhere i don't really have to worry about i am only bothered about upper density and therefore my definition becomes simpler for me i will define the upper density as the limit supremum of the same quantity i look at the cardinality of b intersection minus n comma n within square brackets divided by 2n plus 1 because i am interested only in the upper density i will give a notation to this upper density as delta of b so what does schmiderity's theorem tell me schmiderity's theorem tells me if b is a subset of the set of integers with delta of b strictly positive then b contains ala is what the schmiderity's theorem tells me this is a picture of andre uh, schmiderity taken at the queen mary uh, queen mary university in london in 2014 uh, he was a regular participant in the british math colloquium festival uh, the united kingdom has this festival of 5 days called the british math colloquium wherein the first two days are devoted to pure mathematics the last two days of the week are devoted to applied mathematics and the third day in between uh, is usually devoted to the transition that you make from your pure mathematics to applied mathematics it's a very you know uh, very colorful colloquium and uh, you know there are several people who come there and there are several talks that happen there it's uh, and you can hear whatever you want to hear you know under the sun in 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 those colloquia let's use uh, schmiderity's theorem to prove van der waarden's theorem what do you know about delta of z by definition you want to look at z 
intersection minus n comma n within square brackets which turns out to be minus n comma n within square brackets itself you want to look at the cardinality this would be 2n plus 1 you have a 2n plus 1 in the denominator they cancel out each other and then you have 1 your limit or your limit supremum no longer makes sense you only have a constant sequence and therefore the density the density of the set of integers is equal to 1 further for disjoint sets a and b we have delta of a union b to be equal to delta of a plus delta of b and therefore if i take this particular partition of the set of integers b1 union etc until br and look for the maximum of delta of bi for my i running from 1 to r this is definitely bigger than or equal to 1 by r and because my r is already fixed my 1 by r is a strictly positive quantity and therefore wherever this maximum is achieved that bi should contain all r so proving van der Waerden's theorem using Schemmerer's theorem is a cakewalk we have just done it in the next three lines but then we also need to look at Schemmerer's theorem for that now but before we go there let's look at a few remarks finite sets have density zero and hence by Schemmerer's theorem finite sets do not contain ala my second remark says the set of odd numbers has density half and so does the set of even numbers and hence both sets contain ala the set of composite numbers has upper density equal to 1 and hence the set of composite numbers contains ala let's look at the set of prime numbers the, set, the prime numbers are you know very sparse and therefore the density of the prime numbers is zero the upper density of the set of prime numbers is zero and therefore again appealing to Schemmerer's theorem the set of primes does not contain alap is that correct we know that uh, there is a recent result which says that the set of primes contains alap right of course Schemmerer's theorem is a one-way theorem. It tells you if the upper density is strictly positive, then the set contains all up. It's, it doesn't tell you anything about the other way around. In fact, the last statement I've said is wrong. The upper density uh, of the set of primes is equal to zero, and therefore, you cannot apply Schemmerer's theorem. And therefore, you do not know by Schemmerer's theorem if the set of primes contain all up or not. That's what you should say. Even in the first of these remarks, when I say finite sets have density zero, okay, so what? I know because it's a finite set, it does not contain all up. That is the only thing that I can say. It is not due to Schemmerer's theorem. Let's look at the converse to the Schemmerer's theorem. Let's consider this set B equal to set of all these numbers n cube, n cube plus one, etc., until n cube plus n minus 1 where the union is taken over all n's bigger than or equal to 1. The upper density of my set B, I can alternately define this as limit supremum of the cardinality of B intersection minus n cube comma n cube within square brackets divided by, now the number of elements that you will have here will be 2n cube plus 1. Let's calculate this quantity. We started with n bigger than or equal to 1 and therefore your b intersection minus n cube to 0. That would be an empty set. Whereas the cardinality of b intersection 1 comma n cube. Let's look at what happens to this. What happens when n is equal to 1? The only term you have in that B when N is equal to 1 is 1 itself. So you will have one element there. When you have N is equal to 2, you will have 
2 cube and 2 cube plus 1. When you have n equal to 3, you will have 3 cube plus 1 and 3 cube plus 2, etc. And therefore, when I take n, you will have n many elements over there. And so, the cardinality of the set B intersection 1 comma n cube should be less than or equal to, I say less than or equal to just being abundantly careful because, hey, you know what, as, as I approach n, maybe I'll just have fewer numbers over there. And therefore, I will write this as 1 plus 2 plus etc. until n. Now, this is equal to n into n plus 1 by 2, again, by a high school formula that you already know. And therefore, the upper density of your set B is given by, it should be given by limit supremum n going to infinity, n squared plus n divided by 2 times 2n cube plus 1. Now, your n has your, I mean, the numerator has a polynomial of order 2 in n, the denominator has a polynomial of order 3 in n, and therefore, as your n goes to infinity, this has to go to 0. The upper density cannot be negative by your definition, and therefore, if the upper density is less than or equal to 0, it is actually equal to 0. But then, you know that for every k in Z+, plus, your definition of the set B gives you k consecutive integers, k cube, k cube plus 1, etc., until k cube plus k minus 1. And therefore, what do you know? The converse to the Schemeridis theorem is not true. This is what you know regarding its converse. In fact, uh, let's look at uh, the history uh, of this problem. The Schemeridis theorem was conjectured by Erdős and Turan in 1936. This is, see, this problem is very, uh, how do you call it, you know, simp uh, uh, prototype of how math problems are. A problem that starts as early as in 1936. I mean, the Van der Woerden theorem comes from 1927, but then uh, this conjecture of Erdős and Turan came about in 1936. Roth proved the theorem in 1950 for length 3. So he obtained an arithmetic progression of length 3 when the set has upper density strictly positive in 1950. Schemeridi proved the theorem in 1969 for length 4. In 1975, the theorem was proved in all generality as we have stated earlier called the Schemeridi's theorem. But then, the history does not stop there. In 1977, Furstenberg gave a different proof for Schemeridi's theorem using ergodic theory. This is where my job comes in, my interest comes in to look at the proof and say, and see, you know, how elegant the proof is. In fact, using ideas developed by Furstenberg, Green and Tau develop these ideas from ergodic theory to prove that the set of primes contains ALAP in 2004. Uh, one of them was awarded the uh, Fields Medal for this in 2004 or 5, I, I forget now. Uh, a related conjecture, which I said I will, I will, I will give you, is a $5,000 open problem. Uh, it still remains uh, open. Uh, this was actually earlier on, it was a $3,000 open problem. And then uh, I think this the, the prize money was enhanced sometime in 1990s or something like that. Uh, the conjecture is due to Erdős, where he says, let B be a subset of Z plus, set of positive integers, such that summation N in B 1 by N diverges. So I'm looking for a subset of the set of the set of positive integers, which satisfies summation n in b one by n diverges. Then Erdős conjectured that b contains ALAP. The Green Tau theorem of two thousand four satisfies the hypothesis in the sense that you are looking at the set of primes. If you look at the set of primes, then summation one by n diverges. And they have proved that the set of primes contain ALAP. 
But then Ergish's conjecture is even more general. It doesn't talk to you about any specific set. It says, take any set B, satisfies this hypothesis, then B contains Alap, is what Erdish conjectured. And this problem, as I said, is still open for any one of you to solve and claim the $5,000 uh, from the appropriate people. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Paul Erdish and Pal Turan. Let's look at Furstenberg's proof of Shemiridi. I'm not going to give you the whole proof. I'm just only, I'm, I'm only going to discuss some ideas behind the proof that make us understand how Shemiridi's theorem works. Let's consider x to be the set of 0, 1 power z. What do we mean by this notation? We mean we consider the set of all doubly infinite sequences where the members of the sequences are either 0 or 1. Every member in the set looks like x equal to dot 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 x minus 2, x minus 1, x naught, x1, x2, dot dot dot. So it's doubly infinite, doubly, I mean infinite on both ends such that my xn is either 0 or 1. This is what my space x looks like. Now there are a lot of properties of this space big X. I'm not going to discuss all those properties for this lecture, but then one can prove that you can accord a metric to this space. You can make this space a topological space. This is actually a measure space. It's a measurable space. And so, you know, you can accord all sorts of nice properties to the space. I'll define a map sigma from x to x given by, if I look at the nth coordinate after my operation of sigma at a point x, it should be equal to x n plus 1. How does one uh, explain this? Let's take any arbitrary uh, you know, element from big X. The arbitrary element from big X should look like dot 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 x minus 2, x minus 1, x naught, x1, x2, dot dot dot, where your x naught appears in the zeroth position. When I apply sigma on this word, it takes me to another word wherein my x1 now appears in the zeroth position. What does it mean? It means it moves the entire sequence one place to the left, retaining every coordinate all along both the uh, doubly infinite uh, you know, positions. This is how I define my map little sigma on the space big X. Now, using the set B given in Shemiridi's theorem, we will now define a point little x such that the nth coordinate of your point x is equal to 1 if n is in B and it will be equal to 0 if n is not in B. So I can write down my xn in this fashion. My b is a subset of integers that we already said. And therefore, if my n belongs to b in this particular uh, element x, I will take the nth coordinate to be equal to 1. If n is not in d, I will take this to be equal to 0. I have an element x in this particular fashion that comes from my space big x. From now on, this little x will be fixed as what we have defined. This little is this little x. I mean, if you actually look at it, 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 it is nothing but a characteristic function of your set B. If the element is in B, it gives you one. If the element is not in B, it gives you zero, which is exactly the same as what your characteristic function does. Nevertheless, the only extra thing that this does is I'm going to write this as a doubly infinite sequence. That's the only thing that this does. Okay. Let E be some subset of big X given by set of all Y in X such that the zeroth component of my point Y is 1. Whenever my Y naught is equal to 1 for any point, I will take that to be in my set E. 
Now let's ask a question. Among the two n plus one numbers in minus n comma plus n, how many i's have the property that sigma to the i x belongs to E? My x is the same as what we fixed based on the set we took uh, B from Schemmerdy's theorem. And this asks you among the 2n plus 1 number that you have between minus n and plus n, how many i's have the property that sigma to the i x belongs to E? If my sigma to the i x should belong to E, it needs to satisfy the zeroth coordinate of my sigma to the i x should be equal to 1. This is what my E is by definition. Or when can you have sigma to the i x, the zeroth coordinate of this element to be equal to 1? If your x sub i is equal to 1, you want to apply sigma to the point x i many times and look at the zeroth coordinate. If you apply sigma once to x and look at the zeroth coordinate, by definition, you know it should be equal to x1. You apply it once more, you get x2, etc. So if you apply it i many times and look at the zeroth coordinate of sigma to the i x, you would have reached x sub i. So you want to know when your x i is equal to 1. But then you constructed your point x in such a fashion that if your x i is equal to 1, it means i belongs to b. So what does the question now reduced to? Among the 2n plus 1 numbers in minus n comma n, how many i's have the property that it belongs to b? In other words, the cardinality of the set b intersection minus n comma n within square brackets is the same as the cardinality of the set i in minus n comma n within square brackets such that your sigma to the i x belongs to E. Okay. Let's define something called mu n of E as the cardinality of the set i minus n comma n such that sigma to the i x belongs to E divided by 2 n plus 1. Okay. But you know what? I know what the numerator is actually equal to. The numerator is actually equal to the cardinality of B intersection minus N comma N. And if I am looking at the cardinality of B intersection minus N comma N divided by 2 N plus 1, the limit supremum of that was defined as delta of B. And therefore, what do we have? We have delta of B to be equal to limit supremum mu N of E. Now, if it's a limit, uh, so this is this is the limit supremum that has been achieved. What does it mean? It means I can choose a subsequence of mu uh, n. We will call this subsequence as mu n k in such a fashion that when you look at mu n k of E, this will converge to delta of B. Okay. Moreover, the cardinalities of the set i in minus nk comma nk such that sigma to the i x belongs to E and i in minus nk comma nk such that sigma to the i x belongs to sigma inverse of E, these can differ at most by 2. And therefore, when I look at the difference between mu n k of E minus mu n k of sigma inverse of E, what will I have? I'll have 2 in the numerator, I'll have 2 n plus 1 in the denominator, and as my n k goes to infinity, my numerator is bounded, my denominator grows, and therefore this will converge to 0. Now I'm going to uh, write down one final step which uh, possibly people who are just now entering mathematics may not have seen. Uh, of course, I'm not giving you the entire proof here. I'm only giving you 
ideas behind the proof uh, based on the topology that we have on the space x we can actually prove a perfect metric space etc and given that i mean I'll, I'll use some facts from functional analysis to say that i can find the weak star limit of the sequence mu and k or possibly a subsequence of mu and k let's call it mu and k j and the weak star limit is equal to mu now what does this mu do to me it actually does that my mu of e and mu of sigma inverse of e differ by actually they don't differ you said already that mu n k of e minus mu n k of sigma inverse of e converges to zero if you take mu to be the weak star limit of this sequence or a subsequence from here then it actually means that modulus of mu of e minus mu of sigma inverse of e should be equal to zero i can choose uh, a weak star limit of the sequence in this fashion that does this job for me i agree that this particular slide would have been uh, packed with materials let's take a little respite let's look at the picture of uh, hillel uh, fussenberg this is a picture of him at the hebrew university jerusalem in, in 2020 uh i actually thought i had a picture of first impact that i took of him uh, in 2019 when i went there uh, but unfortunately i wasn't able to locate that picture and i had to still uh, depend on wikipedia for this picture again he's a very nice you know gentleman extremely nice gentleman uh, and who's extremely interested in talking uh, mathematics and talks mathematics in absolute simple language does not terrify you at all he is a very nice gentleman that way let's continue with the proof now poincare recurrence theorem now poincare recurrence theorem tells you under the conditions that we have whatever we already have there exists d in the set of positive integers such that your mu of e intersection sigma to the minus d of e is bigger than 0 this is what poincare recurrence theorem tells you what did fustenberg do he actually improvised this poincare recurrence theorem to say this for every k in z plus there exists a d in z plus such that when you look at the measure of e intersection sigma to the minus d e intersection etc intersection sigma to the minus k d e this when you look at mu of this this will be bigger than 0 now you think about this from the poincare recurrence theorem the proof of fustenberg's improvement uh, i mean should be immediately uh, i mean the, the proof of it should immediately click inside your mind you take, take e to be a set which has positive mu then poincare recurrence theorem tells you that hey you know what when i look at sigma inverses there exists a d wherein my e intersection sigma to the minus d e will have mu positive okay good enough if you have e intersection sigma to the minus d e have a mu positive then of course there is another place where this will now intersect with some other sigma to the minus d1 e so you just need to collect all these things take the lcm and then write this out telling that my mu of e intersection e uh, i'm sorry mu of e intersection sigma to the minus d e intersection etc sigma to the minus k d e is bigger than zero what does it mean for this intersection to have mu bigger than 0 we said mu is a weak star limit which means it is a measure uh, in some sense if it is a measure it means that this set is not empty it needs to contain some point and what should that point be 
recall your definition of mu n your mu n was defined using something that to some set it said your sigma to the i x this should belong to e intersection sigma to the minus d e intersection etc all the way until sigma to the minus k d e what does it mean for sigma to the i x to belong to this intersection it means your sigma to the i x belongs to each of this set it should belong to e your sigma to the i x should belong to sigma to the minus d of e which means sigma to the i plus d of x should belong to e etc until sigma to the i plus k d x belongs to e what does it mean for these many points to belong to e it means the zeroth component of these points should be uh, should be one according to your definition of e that's what it is which then means that i i plus d etc until i plus k d belongs to the set b and therefore what have you proved you have proved that if b is a set that contains uh, that has a strictly positive upper density wait where did we use a b to be a strictly positive upper density thing we have used it exactly here where we say mu of e is bigger than 0 how did you define your mu of e you defined your mu of e to be the weak star limit of mu n k j of e that will converge to delta of b your mu of e bigger than 0 is a necessary condition you to write the poincare recurrence theorem wherein you get this integer d that gives you e intersection sigma to the minus d e to have strictly positive measure and therefore if b is a set of strictly positive upper density you can find an arbitrarily long arithmetic progression inside that set b we have also already said that if the upper density of a set is zero then schemerady's theorem does not apply there in fact we have constructed an example wherein we said this particular set b has upper density to be equal to zero but still it contains a la thank you very much uh, thank you sir for the wonderful talk that you have presented right now Uh, i would like to mention two things which i felt really nice was the fact that you abbreviated your title in that form and gave a really nice analogy which was really fascinating to hear and secondly uh, for frostenberg being the recent abel prize awardee like uh, i personally didn't have much chance to explore any of his work so thanks for giving an overview of some of the work that he has done that was really sure. nice i would like to ask if anyone in the audience has any particular question or comments or anything uh, we can take that right now dr srigiri so what is your feeling about this conjecture do you think it's true this erdos conjecture oh 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 i'll tell you, i mean i i i do not work in number theory i only work in ergodic theory and you know sometimes ergodic theory throws up some interesting you know stuff in number theory and therefore i look at them no specialist in number theory especially when a question comes from a person like you i know i have to reserve my comments i have no clue i i have no clue about whether it could be true or otherwise okay uh any any other questions uh... there are two things when nobody asks any questions at the end of the talk uh either the yeah. talk was very clear or the talk was too confusing and therefore they couldn't get anything out of it and decided not to ask anything uh so there's a question uh, well there's a comment okay uh from somya jain who says i just have one comment the talk was very friendly to follow mm -hmm. as someone who is just beginning to study maths i'm glad i could make it accessible to you uh i had a question could you go please go back to your slides Uh, you have any slide uh, number that you prefer on the idea of uh, shemerity's proof i believe 
uh, where you mentioned about, is true for Van der uh, where you mentioned about weak limit i guess somewhere over there i think oh, right. weak limit weak star limit yeah yeah, yeah. so hmm. over here can you explain this uh, last paragraph i said choose a subsequence a mu n k of mu n such that your mu n k of e converges to delta of b uh, you already have that your delta of b to be equal to limit supremum n going to infinity mu n of e and therefore i can choose a subsequence you treat all these things as real numbers you don't really have to worry about what your b is what your e is and stuff like that right let's say l is a limit l is equal to limit supremum of some sequence a n then what i'm telling you is there exists a subsequence a n k such that my a n k actually converges to l itself no longer limit supremum it actually converges to l the limit of the sequence a n k is l is that fine yeah that's fine yeah moreover the cardinalities of the sets i n minus n k comma n k such that sigma to the i x in e and the set i in minus n k comma n k such that sigma to the i x is in sigma inverse e may differ at most by 2 and hence my modulus of mu n k e minus mu n k sigma inverse e should converge to 0. I don't see how uh, they may Why these two things should differ at most by 2, right? Yeah. Now this is, I mean, this this involves some amount of calculation, but I mean, it 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 only differs at most by two. Take that from me for at least for this talk. Uh, I mean, it's not okay. It's not a pleasant calculation. You need to kind of you know uh, write down a few lines and then see that this actually differs at most by two. But right. even otherwise, let's not let's not even go there. Even otherwise, let us look at it in this particular fashion. Uh, let's look at these sets and what is the cardinality you know by which they will differ and stuff like that let us look at mu n k of e and mu n k of sigma inverse of e by definition my mu n of e is a number between 0 and 1 is that correct yeah yes and therefore what i will have is my modulus of mu n k of e and my uh, and the, 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 the difference between mu n k of e and my mu n k of uh, sigma inverse of e this can differ at most by 2 and i will have a 2n plus 1 in the denominator is that correct yeah and so either way this should converge to zero yeah right and that's what I'm going to be bothered about because I'm not even taking this sequence mu n k. I'm going to be taking a further subsequence of this if because you see, uh, as I've written, this only converges to zero. I do not know if I can take this uh, mu n k itself and ask it to converge to somewhere. And therefore, if this is not possible, I will only take a subsequence of mu n k, which I will call as mu n k j. I did not write this here because I did not want notations to terrify people and I just kind of kept it simple in that particular fashion. But this is quite calculable. Right, right. Have... There are a few more questions in the chat. Uh, firstly, uh, someone okay. uh, like Soumya wants a clarification on the definition of weak star limit which you have defined as a subsequence limit. So maybe you can tell that again. Okay, a weak star limit is something that you will do in uh, on measure theory or later on you will have to do in final analysis. I'll actually paraphrase uh, the definition. I'm not giving you the proper definition. I'm only giving you a definition for the purposes of understanding what this is. Let us take mu n to be a sequence that I can define on sets in this particular, in, in, in this fashion or in some fashion, whatever that is. And they take me to a real number. My A is a set. Mu n is a function that I define from the set A or the set of subsets of A 
or the set of some special subsets of A to real numbers. Over here, you happen to have this to be within 0, 1. Let's take f to be a continuous, a real value continuous function defined on your set A. If it's a continuous function, it, and my mu is a measure, it makes sense for me to look at the sequence integral f d mu n. My integral f d mu n is a sequence of real numbers. Why? Because my f is real valued, and my mu n's are also, uh, I mean, they are, they are measures that accords real values uh, on sets. And therefore, I look at the integral over this entire set A, f d mu n. This is a sequence of real numbers. Suppose the sequence of real numbers converges to some limit with the property that I can write this limit as integral f d mu. I have not changed the function. My function f remains the same. If I can find a measure mu in such a fashion that integral f d mu n converges to integral f d mu for every continuous function f defined on A, then mu is said to be the weak star limit of your sequence mu n. Again, as I said, uh, I'm just kind of giving you a characterization for my weak star limit because that makes my job easy here. You will learn about weak star limits anyway during your master's course, uh, sometime during your measure theory or your, or, or your functional analysis uh, courses. Yes, next question, please. From so, Akash Gupta, who asks, okay. Tom, are you talking about uh, 0, 1 raised to n? Uh, sir, I would, uh, since you talked about uh, weak star convergence, so basically, which norm you are taking on this space capital X? Actually, it is uh, clear to me it's a metric space and topological, but how, yes. uh, which norm basically you are taking? I mean, deliberately, I did not define uh, a metric or a topology or a measure on the space X. Uh, but you look at X. How is your X given? Just give me a minute. Let's go to X, the definition of X. Let's look at the definition of X. Your X is equal to dot, 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 X minus 2, X minus 1, X naught, X1, X2, dot, dot, dot. Right. Similarly, take another point Y equal to dot 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 y minus 2 y minus 1 y naught y1 y2 etc now how do you want to define a distance between any two points x and y you want to define distance in such a fashion that if they agree for a long period of time they should be close if they do not agree even to start with then they should be far apart from each other Based on this, I will define a distance which tells me I need to compare my x0 and y0. If they are equal, then I will compare the pairs x minus 1, y minus 1, and x1, y1. If both these pairs agree, then I will go to the next pairs x minus 2, y minus 2, and x2, y2. Wherever they do not agree, I will say, I will define a distance in such a fashion that, let's say, theta is some number between 0 and 1, uh, open at both, both ends, 0 is strictly less than theta, strictly less than 1. I will say the distance between x and y is defined to be theta power n of x comma y, where n is the first instance where this disagreement happens between the corresponding pairs in x and y. If I define a distance in this, if I define distance in this fashion on my space X, then my X is a metric space. I can, I mean, there is a topology that this metric would define. I can take the discrete topology on my zero comma one and consider the corresponding product taken of topology on X, 
which will then give me if i fix a finite set of coordinates these sets will remain both open and closed and they will form a basis for my topology my space x becomes a compact metric space if it is a compact metric space when i look at functions uh, real valued functions f defined from x to r i know how to define my norm of f now right ah uh, yes only, sir i'm only going to look at supremum of modulus of f of x whenever my x comes from my big x yes yeah, sir okay thank you sir. thanks a lot sure okay so i guess uh, this will be the last question uh, this is sure. from me you mentioned that one special case of edwards conjecture essentially for the primes uh, mm. it's being solved by tau and green mm. uh, so what i was thinking that uh, would you like to give a brief idea of how that work we are not very sure that uh, that if something works for the set of primes it will work for an arbitrary set mm. but then it gives us a intuition like if something works for a smaller set of primes then it might work for like the set which includes composite numbers as well so do you can you give a brief idea of how uh, tau and green's proof to work for the primes no i mean no the, i mean the proof it, the proof is very involved and i'm i'm i mean this describing that proof in two or three lines would be uh, a disservice to the proof itself uh, by green and tau and therefore i am not even going to attempt that but then i'll say definitely that the ideas that green and tau kind of came up with is a very organic building from where sustenberg left shemrady's uh, proof uh there is not merely ergodic theory that's involved in green tau's proof in fact ergodic theory is only a part of the proof of the green tau theorem we deal with a whole lot of combinatorial ideas and stuff like that which is essentially what you will find in uh, number theory uh, you know stuff like that and I, again no i have not completely gone through uh, green tau's uh, paper as well i have only read bits and parts of it that have interested me and therefore i have not uh, really gone through the complete paper of green and tau as well uh, and i mean uh, when one does not go through all papers that are being that, that are being uh, posted up right you you read things only that interest yeah. you and so i have not really done that yeah uh, that that is obviously very true so i like to tell everyone that if they can thank the speaker today by turning on their mics clap thank you so, thank you again everyone uh, so this is the end of the session we can announce right now so uh, we will be back with dr vijay session which will be at 2:30 to today afternoon i hope everyone who is here now will be able to join and there will be more people i guess and uh, if you have uh, like friends who are willing to join but they haven't registered just uh, ask them to register right now for the future talks uh, they can do that and if there are no other uh, questions or comments or suggestions then we can close uh, the session for now and thank you to dr shree again for speaking today thank you very much